I got about two days into it and I called my dad and I was like, Hey, I don't have any money left for food. And I still have two days left. And my dad said, go take your guitar down to the bar car. Oh no. And I was like, well, I was kind of hoping like maybe a Western <laughs> union. you know. So I sat there after I got off the phone with him for a while and I did it and I made like 40 bucks. I paid for my food. For, and then I, I started figuring out, oh, okay, well, I'm going to have to figure this out. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Unbeatable. You get a chance to hear from Jeremy McComb today, and he's going to describe for you the hard knocks and the heavy temptations of life on the road as a musician. Get this, even as a musician's kid from 11, 12, 13 years old. Can't wait to introduce you to Jeremy McComb. These stories of triumph over adversity will help you handle your toughest days in life. You're listening to Unbeatable with Jeff Struker. Well, hey, Jeremy, thank you so much for joining me for this uh, Christmas season episode of Unbeatable. It's great to have you. It's great to be here. It's an honor to be on your podcast. So oh, thank you man, I, I appreciate you saying that. Um, I want you to kind of describe a little bit of how you ended up in the music industry, living in Nashville. How'd you go from, you know, growing up in the mountains of Idaho to Nashville? Can you tell us a little bit about the, your, your backstory and your childhood? Yeah. If you, if you have about, uh, about I got about two hours. hours so sure. <laughs> you know, I, I grew up, like you said, in North Idaho in the Valley there uh, between Spokane, Washington and Coeur d'Alene. There's a, thing that they call the Rathdrum Prairie. And it, uh, I grew up in a valley that was created by um, a glacier break that sent a wall of water through the Pacific Northwest and created this riverbed valley um, up in North Idaho. And it's funny because it's um, my childhood and my path kind of followed the same uh, type of path of uh, small explosions and, and uh, <laughs> missteps awesome. and, yeah. and carving slowly your way through the rocks. So I, I grew up in the Northwest, uh, was born nine months after um, Mount St. Helens erupted to a musician and a waitress who were both married to other people at the time. And um, yeah, so was born there, brought up in a musical family. I'm a sixth generation musician, started, um, sleeping behind my dad's amp and uh, yeah. his, his bands when I was about five years old. And so was really heavily introduced to, you know, bar life and tavern life and, and all the things that my dad played at biker parties and, and shit like that. And so from there ended up, um, you know, a solid D student. Through <laughs> all right. Way to go. <laughs> yeah. And uh, started playing, you know, on my own when I was about 13, put together a band. My first band was a 50s band. And then you had um, a 50s band at 13 years old. Yeah, it was very hard to find other kids. Yeah, you, you didn't people. have a whole lot of competition for 13 year old singing Sha Na Na. No, I didn't. <laughs> no, and everybody was so perplexed by the, the name of the band was Class of 56. And I couldn't get any other kids really who were interested in <laughs> you know, playing Temptations and, you know, all this yeah. 50s music. And um, and so I started this band and then started working at a club called Kelly's, which was like the premier club in the area. And I had been playing all the bars around and I was, I guess, 15 uh, when I started working at Kelly's, 15 or 16 years old. And it just totally enveloped my life. Um, it was a place where Nashville artists would come through on their way up uh -huh. and their way down. So when they had their first hit, they would come play, you know, to about 700 people. And then after their career was kind of on the backside, they would come play to 700 people. And, um, the same 700 that have been there for like 30 years, you know, tracking somebody's entire career. Exactly. So it's like, you know, you get the guys on the way up, then you get kind of the legends on the yeah, way down. Yeah. And um, it was an amazing uh, just an amazing education in, you know, at that point I was like, man, I don't want anything to do with school. And so I ended up dropping out. I had a daughter when I was 16 and then dropped out of school. I was like, man, I got to find a way to, you know, 
pay child support and, and figure out what I'm going to do with my life. And it was the first time I had a teacher named Dave Smith who told me I was the only student he ever told uh, to drop out. He said, <laughs> He the said, school shit's not yeah. working out. For yeah. you. you would be better off not being in school at all. You would be a better student if you just weren't in school. Exactly. He goes, man, you're gonna be here until you're 24. Uh, so you should probably find something else to do if if you can do the music thing. And so I just lived at Kelly's and 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 learned, you know, how these social atmospheres work of honky tonks and how yeah. to work a crowd. And thankfully. Kelly was a mentor to me um, in a way that I, that my teachers really never were, you know, he, he taught me how to set goals and he taught me how to learn my craft and hone yeah. my craft. And that led me to a radio station, which um, allowed me to book shows for the club I was playing at. And I booked Larry, the cable guy and um, on his way up and we kind of hit it off, became friends. And a year later I was out on the road with him, you know, as a friend, yeah. like tour managing his comedy tour as it was exploding. So yeah. it was just these weird failures forward. <laughs> Failing forward, falling on your face, but at least you're falling forward. Hey, I, I got to go to the conversation about you being 15 years old and playing in Kelly's bar in just a moment. But it didn't skip my attention that your mom and dad basically had a Mount St. Helens eruption party and ended up conceiving with you. Yes. Um, it also didn't skip my attention that you grew up in quite possibly one of the most beautiful spots in the world. I have yeah. told for people. For people that know me, I've been all over the world. I've had a chance to see beauty in every part of the world, just natural beauty. But I complete. I am personally convinced the most beautiful city on earth is Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Just if you could, if you've never been to the United States, never been to that part of the United States, you have to picture in your mind this postcard beauty, and that's yeah. Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and that was your backyard growing up. Yeah, and it wasn't exciting enough, you know. I I always tell people it's like you you move away from it thinking there's this whole big world out there and you leave and you go, shit, I'm going to, I just to left the most up. beautiful city in the world. Right. Yeah. And I didn't I, realize it until I went someplace else. Exactly. And everywhere I've been, whether in the U S or overseas or anywhere we've toured, it's always so cool to see different cultures, but I've, ne I've never seen anything like Coeur d'Alene. Yeah. If you're, if you get a chance, just Google some images from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. It is spectacularly beautiful. Every it time is. my family and I go through there, I'm like, that's it right here. This is the most beautiful city in the world. Yes. Um, I don't know about the people, but I do know that the, 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 the scenery and the geography around there is just stunning. Well, the people are great too. And, and the cool thing about, North Idaho is there's really this, you know, all my Texas friends always say, you know, you don't mess with Texas and all that, but North Idaho in Western Montana, especially have these attitudes of just, um, it's almost like, a the trailer park rules where all it's right. like, hey, man, if the door's closed, don't come knocking, <laughs> mind your own fucking business. And, uh, and I'll mind mine. Yeah. And, uh, don't ask why I'm here. You know, there's people up there because maybe they're retired and they made their money and they just want to live by the lake. And there's people up there where you're like, there might be people looking for this guy yeah, and yeah. the mountains is where they run to. And so you've got this really unique, different groups of people that you, you could run into just any type of person up there, which yeah. I always liked. So you grew up with a father who was a musician, which means you grew up, you know, sleeping backstage and, plugging yeah. in cables into amps and, you know, surrounded by it probably since your earliest memories. Is this right? Yeah. Yeah. I slept behind my dad's amp. The, the clubs my dad was playing, you know, backstage would be a very glamorous painting of that. It was just the shithole bars. And um, my dad was very popular in that region. So it was five nights a week. I slept behind my dad's amp. My mom and my dad played. And then as my brother got old enough, um, oh, you had a family band going on, right? Yeah. And, and it's, I'm the only child from my parents. Like I said, both my parents were married, uh, and they both had kids. Mount St. Helens erupts and look out, uh, shit hits the fan <laughs> nine months later with me. 
And uh, so my brother was playing, my mom was playing, dad was playing. And um, I slept behind uh, my dad's guitar amp, just kind of watching this insane world of, of the nightlife as a kid where my dad could whip up a crowd into a frenzy and pack dance floor and bring it to the height of tension and then drop it back yeah. down. And, and I was just hooked on it. So you got that education from an early age is what you're saying. Yeah, really, really early. Because I'm I'm sitting there fascinated by the fact that you're a 15 year old kid. Now, when you were 15, you probably didn't think about yourself as a kid, but you're a 15 year old kid playing at Kelly's Bar in a very grown up world. But you're playing, you know, um, yeah, <laughs> and uh, honestly, commanding some attention of people at Kelly's Bar. Um, so yeah. I, I gotta, uh, you know, just learn a little bit about you learning to lead a band, learning to lead people you know, that are in the, in the bar, uh, just like you, your father did. How, how did that, how did you pick those things up along the way? I'm just a sponge. If, if I really enjoy it, I'm a sponge for it and, and I'll work, you know, I've always tried to outwork everybody in the room. So my dad would say, you know, if there's something you want to do, learn every job at the place. And when that guy above you doesn't show up one day, you got his job and, and you can take his job. Boom. And um, you know, it's kind of that few will hunt mentality uh -huh. of like, go out, work harder than everybody. Um, the guy that goes out there and busts his ass the most is going to, is going to win. And so I just always took that on, whether I was working at the radio station and working for free and learning how to do production and learn how to do these music meetings or working at the club where it was like, that's how you work a crowd. And, and, oh, I'm seeing, you know, there's a couple of fights in the back and then all of a sudden it's a slow song and it's like, Oh, you're controlling the vibe. And so watching my dad do it from like super formative years and listening to my dad, bullshit people, he's the <laughs> king of bullshitting. I mean, he just, he could read people and, and, and see what they wanted to hear. It, it was strange. And, and then I started finding myself being able to do that with my teachers I was like, oh man, I can manipulate because really being a front man in a band is really manipulating a crowd. Yeah. And so I began to manipulate my teachers and manipulate my home life and, and, um, you know, trying to figure out how to use those powers for good. Yeah. <laughs> Instead I, of using them for, for great evil. Right. Yeah. And so going from my dad to Kelly Hughes, who was another master front man. Uh -huh. Um, it was just like this nightly education of, oh, man, these guys really know what they're doing. And, and I want to do this at this level. And so um, just buying in 100% and, and never having a plan B. Yeah, so you're, you're bought into music 100%. But I want people to know you don't just have talent as, in music. You become a 23-year-old tour manager for Larry the Cable Guy when his his comedy routine was basically known internationally, man, you're a young guy who has a lot of responsibility for some pretty important, pretty uh, big events. Describe the life of a tour manager at that time for the blue collar, some of the blue collar comedy guys. Yeah. Um, Tell us so what it was like to get her done for Larry, the cable guy. <laughs> That's what I'm asking you. It was crazy because um, you know, cable guy's name is Dan and Dan and I, I, I booked him at the club that I played at at Kelly's. We met each other. He heard my band. We kept in touch over a year. And then we started when the next time he came through, we wrote a couple of just parody songs and he was like, you should come to Montana and do that with me tomorrow night. So tomorrow night, like just yeah. stop what you're doing. Let's go to Montana. Right. And so I said, all right, man. So I met him there and I showed up and, and did it. And then, after the show, he just kind of said, man, it's just me and an opener out here. He had just gotten a bus. Um, he was opening for Foxworthy a ton and then doing these other shows, uh, small theaters. And he said, why don't you, or he said, if you ever want to come out on the road, just come out and hang out for a week. And so uh, I went back home and I just had a gut feeling. I told my dad, I said, you know, I think that I'm going to, take this dude up on it and I don't even know if 
cable guy really meant it when he said yeah, it. But yeah. I looked at his tour schedule and he was going to be in Bloomington, Illinois, and I had no money. I was so broke. And so I borrowed like 75 bucks and I got a sleeper car and an Amtrak train and rode it four and a half, four days to Bloomington, Illinois. Oh, four Dakota. days on a train sounds miserable. That's why it's only 75 bucks. And nobody would endure that. Yeah, kind of pain. exactly. But it was like this transformative ride for me. I'd never really, I mean, I'd been playing in clubs, but I'd never really left my parents. I'd, I hadn't been away from everything that I knew. I always had somebody to help me. Yeah. I always had something happening. And um, I'll never forget. I, I got about two days into it and I called my dad and I was like, Hey, I don't have any money left for food. And I still have two days left. And my dad said, oh, take your guitar down to the bar car. Oh no. And I was like, well, I was kind of hoping like maybe a Western <laughs> union. you know. And my dad was like, yeah, man, tough shit, dude, go take your guitar down to the bar car. And so I sat there after I got off the phone with him for a while and I did it and I made like 40 bucks and it paid for my food. For, and then I, I started figuring out, Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to have to figure this out. Yeah. And so I showed up in Bloomington, Illinois and got on the bus with cable guy. I was supposed to stay out there for a week and he just didn't really have anybody helping him with, you know, just doing sound check or uh -huh. making sure his monitor sounded good or, you know, going to grab it and chew or food or whatever he needed, you know? And so I just kind of started filling that void a little bit. And when it was time to go home, he was like, man, you, you can't go home. You got to stay out here. And so that ended up turning into like, I don't know, it's like three and a half years, four yeah. years something like that of, of doing that. And, you know, he hired me as his tour manager. I had no idea what I was doing. And along the way, I met a couple of guys who are the epitome of tour managing. Uh -huh. Pootie Locke with Willie Nelson's crew and Pootie's passed on now, but uh, Pootie and then uh, Robin Majors who was with Montgomery Gentry at the time. And now he's with Kenny Chesney, but they were guys where I would call and I would be like, Hey, I don't know how to deal with this situation <laughs> or, you know, what do I do? Yeah. So they put up cable guy and his entire team put up with a lot of shit from a 23 year old. Yeah. Who was just it. literally figuring it out along the way. Right. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. No and idea. that moment where you had to call your dad and he said, sell your guitar or, you know, pawn the guitar. That's a moment where you realize just how, hard this industry can be right yeah this is going to be rough and so go down to the bar car and play and put a hat out and uh -huh. it's like okay well <laughs> 40 and bucks at a time I that's right and if i don't play well i don't eat tonight so that starts to become uh, some motivation for you know working the crowd and learning how to yes get people well, engaged. It's that difference of i heard david lee ross say it one david lee ross said one time he said uh you know, boxing for food is different than boxing for fun. And that's kind of what my music career turned into. It was like, well, I, I have to win. I have to be good or I'm not going to eat. But I'm going to starve tonight if I don't, right? right? Yeah. Yeah, you, man, from the earliest age, you were around entertainers, but you were also around some temptations. Um, yeah. And not all of them did you stay no to. So, you, you know, you, you end up getting... And, you know, starting to take some drugs and drugs start to get a hold of you. Can you tell the folks that are kind of new to your story about this part of your life? Yeah, I, you know, as a kid, there was always like this underlying um, depression thing. You know, I think, you know, bipolar stuff runs in my family and, and um, I don't know if that's what it is or, but there was always just this kind of thing that goes where I think you see it in a lot in alcoholic households. Uh -huh. you know, both my parents drank a lot. We were in these weird situations in clubs and arguments and, you know, uh, dishes in the yard and, and, you know, never really knowing how volatile yeah. the household could be um, at night. And so you always had this uncertainty. So started drinking pretty young, um, how young? When you say pretty young, if thirteen. I was going to say if your dad and and mom were at, at the clubs when you were single digits, then yeah, I, I think thirteen is like when I 
started kind of getting after it. I was smoking weed in, you know, junior high and, and then drinking. And then I found because I, I wasn't good at like conflicts. I was, I was very much a, just didn't want to get my ass kicked and I didn't want to get into shit. Um, and I found a way to make friends was to have parties. And my parents were kind of like, well, if you're here partying, it's better than you being yeah. somewhere else and driving around or doing something like that. So I started throwing these parties All my friends would come over and we would just, you know, get shit housed and, and, and drink and, you know, and that was as I was still in school. Um, and so we're having these parties all the time. And then once I get out of school and I end up in Kelly's, you know, there's a lot of other stuff going around and, um, I never got into anything I couldn't really get at, you know, I never got into like any Coke addictions yeah. or any kind of heroin or anything, but, um, there were lots of pain pills that travel around on stages where it'd be, you know, a guitar player. I'd be like, Hey man, you know, I'd be like, Oh gosh, no shoulders killing me. tonight." it's like, Oh, here, take a Soma or here's a, you know, a Demerol or whatever's going around. And so that was kind of the first thing that started really innocently yeah. for me was taking just over the counter, you know, stuff for pain or, um, you know, trying to, get over the hangover you had from the night before yeah. I was getting hangovers pretty, <laughs> pretty young when you're not <laughs> supposed to get hangovers. And so, uh, a lot of drinking and, uh, you know, some of the pills started kicking in and, and those would kind of come off and on. Like I never felt like I had a, a real problem with the pills as much as it would be these kind of ebbs and flows. Um, until you start going like, Oh, I'm taking these all the time. Yeah, I'm now. taking a lot. Right taking a lot of pills. They're not really doing what they used to do. And, um, you know, I'm asking people to buy pills from them. And, and I just felt really, and I've never been, it's so out of my character because I've never been a drug guy, a drug culture guy uh -huh. ever. I've never enjoyed being around that. Um, and so once I kind of got the pills out of the way, you know, the drinking was just heavy for a really long time. Yeah. And, it really wasn't until about uh, four years ago where I started to see like what used to be kind of fun as a teenager into your twenties, now into your thirties where the fun wears off. Now I'm kind of getting angry. Um, the depression is fucking way worse because you're just going through these, yeah. You know, you drink all night and I never drank at home. Like I, I never drank around my wife. I never drank around my kids. Nobody ever saw it. And I always thought, well, that's the responsible thing. Right. I never realized, oh, that's what closeted. <laughs> that's, that's what alcoholics, alcoholics do. <laughs> yeah. So I started to kind of go like, oh, okay. Maybe it isn't normal to have to get an IV in every third city because I'm so dehydrated, dehydrated. from the yeah. bottle of Jim Beam that I drank yesterday. And so once I started to really feel those effects of that, um, and I had changed so many different things in my life. My mom had gotten sober. Uh -huh. That was a huge thing for me because my whole life, that was just a shit show of, you know, mom and dad, um, alcoholic household always loved each other, but the love often showed itself, especially in just arguments, yeah. especially when I was young and yeah. it was, you know, clothes in the yard and broken dishes and just shit scattered everywhere. And so I think that was kind of my coping mechanism was to start numbing things. And what I didn't realize was as you numb those things, the depression sinks in worse and would get a little deeper and a little deeper to where, um, you know, there were a couple of times where, I mean, albums saved my life yeah. because it was in such a dark place where I was like, man, it would just be better to just end it end it all. And just um, go out in the woods. And, you know, I'd had a couple of friends who um, I had a, a friend of mine in ninth grade uh, named Joey who accidentally hung himself. And that impacted me a lot more than I thought it did at the time. We weren't like extremely close, but we uh -huh. were out. And, um, 
And then that kind of started me onto this little patch of depression that just lasted ever. And, and it was the first time where, um, a Sean Mullins record called, uh, soul's core. And then the Tom Petty wildflowers mm -hmm. album, like literally saved my life when I was sitting there going like, I should just go, I should just go out and, and end it, you know, as a, as a teenager. Yeah. Um, that and my daughter, I, that was a, a new thing for a 16 year old to try to wrap your brain around yeah, being a it, dad trying to, uh, yeah. And I think, you know, she, she kind of took the brunt of me not knowing what the fuck I was doing for the last 20 years mm -hmm. and, and really gave, um, a great sc springboard for her brothers now, which are eight <laughs> and four to have a very present yeah. dad. Yeah. And she didn't get to have that, but she really, she always knew that, you know, I loved her and that I was always there and, and I never left, but, um, present wasn't, you know, I was always on the road. And, yeah. Um, breaking promises and, and shit like oh, yeah. that, that goes with that depression. And, and then it wasn't till, you know, I've had several bouts of these depressive episodes where it would just get really, really dark. And, um, I would self-sabotage uh -huh. just to think that I needed to do that to write or to be a country. Be a better singer. artist. Yeah. As dumb as it sounds, but you know, you see all this stuff from, Steve Earl, or you would see the Tom Petty stuff, or mm -hmm. you would see the Willie Nelson shit where you're like, maybe I need to just be miserable. Maybe I just need to wreck my life so that I can have some song material. Right. And you don't consciously think that way, but I sabotage so many. I broke people's hearts. I broke people's trust. I did it all on purpose and to stay miserable. Um, if I got in a situation that was too good, I would be like, I don't deserve this. And, and I would try to self destruct. Screw it up and, and I, I, I did it with my wife. Uh, she's been with me 13 years and we were about three years into it. And I tried to totally self-destruct yeah. that because it was just too good and felt too right. Yeah. And uh, thankfully she didn't let me get into that. So she's been a big part of me coming full circle and philosophy and yeah, just life changes. But seeing my mom get sober was the first thing where I was like, if she can do it, uh, if she can do it, fucking anybody can yeah. do it. And I owe it to myself to, to do that. Yeah. I want people to hear what you're saying right now. Like if you're turning to pills, turn into a bottle because there's some really bad stuff going on in your life. And even as you just described to Jeremy, you know, real, no kidding, legit depression. That's really, really hard to make your way through the pills and the bottles ultimately didn't work though. Right. I mean, it oh, didn't, it so didn't make worse. the depression go away temporarily it did because you were so drunk you didn't notice it but the next morning it's worse right yeah and it fogs your it, it just fogs your ability to clearly see things in the present like and then i look back and i'm like why you know i was stressing about it, shit that never even happened yeah. Yeah. and and then all the drama that was in my life was self-made uh -huh. and once i got out of that um I was like, fuck, I, there is no drama. Like things are good. I, and, and I need to take responsibility for my actions. I yeah. need to be a better husband. I need to be a better dad. I need to be a better friend. Um, and so that starts with, then you start to have these difficult conversations with yourself of, uh -huh. does this person that I like to hang out with bring out the best or the worst in me? Um, are they, do they demand the best yeah. or are they cool with me being the drunk dipshit because I'm funny, you know, or because we go out and we do crazy shit together. And once I started seeing those, I'm like, okay, man, I got a lot I of people. I got to change some people that I'm hanging out with, right? Yeah. And I had to cut a lot of them. A lot of them were really tough. Some of them were really tough. Yeah. And, and the amazing thing was the more, um, and this is something that I think I heard Steve Harvey say one time. He said, you can't get the good shit in your life until you make room for it. And, oh, yeah. you know, you can, you can pray and you can ask God for things and you can do all the right things, but until you make room for the good st stuff to happen. And as soon as I started pulling these things back, my career started happening. How about the that? one that I actually wanted. Yeah. And 
the right people started coming into my life and these opportunities started to come. And, and it was like a snowball where I was like, why was this? I wasn't ready yeah. for these things. It wasn't that I was getting a raw deal or that uh-huh. you know, God didn't give a shit or no, you know, nobody's hearing what I need. Um, man, I was standing in my own way the whole time. Yeah. And until I got it right, um, you know, it's kind of that uh, I'll show me <laughs> to be happy. <laughs> All right. <you> know? <laughs> and uh, once I got out of my own way, good things started to follow. But um, I had to make room for the good things by, you know, cleaning house on the bad shit. Yeah, I want you to mention to people. So I'm hearing you say this really clearly. I hope others hear it, but I want you to just get real honest with them for a minute about that battle out of the pills and the battle off of the bottle because it doesn't come easy. Part of that battle you've just described is I got to take a hard look at the people that I'm hanging with and stop hanging with some people that I don't need to hang with anymore. Yeah. But this podcast is called unbeatable because there are some people that in circumstances that you're in, they would literally drink themselves to death. They would take enough pills that they would OD and just become another statistic. And you decided that's not going to be me, but it didn't happen easy. No. And it, it came from, because I never felt like I was out of control. Like I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, I didn't feel like I was hurting anybody because I never did it at home. My uh-huh. kids never saw it. My wife never saw it. My wife had no idea. And the more that I kind of tell her about it now, she's like, Jesus. I she was like, you're such a loser or you were yeah, such yeah. a loser. And, and it was one of those things where I didn't realize that I was hiding it. I just thought, well, it's something to do on the road because you're unchecked on the road. Yeah. There, there's not really any, you know, if, if I cracked a beer, and I've got buddies that do this really successfully. They can have a beer in the afternoon, a margarita at night, and that's it. And, and they're good with it. And it's not an issue for them. And I'm not, I've never been one of those where it's like, you know, everybody needs to be sober yeah. or whatever. But for me and the depression that I had that would come after drinking a bottle the night before yeah. and, you know, making bad decisions and just opening yourself up for, for bullshit. And, you know, I started to think about, I'm like, man, I could ruin my freaking life yeah. out here yeah. or end it or, or fuck something up so bad that, um, I would never recover from it, you yeah. know, whether it be losing your wife or losing your kids or losing the life that you really love was not easy, um, in the offset, but I've always had, I think in my, you know, this is something my mom and my dad both are able to do. Like when my mom decided, like, I'm done with That's this it, shit. I'm done. She could be done. And um, I can't imagine what she went through when she ended it. Because, it, I mean, it had to have been withdrawals. It oh, had yeah. to have been a ton of stuff. And she just ate it. She never told anybody about how shitty it was. She never asked anyone else to change their lifestyle. She just changed hers. And. So that was the thing that really gave me the first step where I was like, okay, well, if she can do it, I can do it. Yeah. And I stopped and um, I just never wanted to go back to that. And I never said, you know, I quit drinking. I just said, you know, I, I'm not getting drunk anymore. And and once I went there, then it was like the not drinking was just, I'm like, well, what? why would I go have one yeah. shot? Yeah. You know, it doesn't make any Cause sense. Because that will so, lead to a fifth of Jack Daniels. So yeah, exactly. Exactly. I say, so, I'm, I'm, I'm asking this question because there are guys and gals that are really, really struggling. And no matter how hard they struggle, they keep failing. And it doesn't seem like they're getting any success over a drug addiction, alcohol addiction, num, name a half a dozen other addictions. And I don't want people to hear your story, Jeremy, and say, oh, for Jeremy, he just made a decision. And it was all easy after that because it yeah. certainly wasn't. No, temptation is always there. And And I think that you have to find even the little failures as opportunities, you know, where you're like, uh, you know, I struggled today or to have people to talk to, you know, I've got a really great group of people now in my life that were not there um, because I had other people around. And so to be able to just have honest conversations with people and um, especially hard when you're playing shows and people want to buy you drinks because that's their way of saying thank you. Um, that was really hard for me at first when people would be like, 
you know, hey man, do you want a shot? And I'd be like, no, man, I'm good. And they're like, oh, what? You're too fucking good to drink with me, you know? And and I was always brought up, you never turn down a drink because that was that's a way rude. of someone thanking you, right? Yeah. And so you know, it started off with me going like, oh man, I'm on gummy bears right now, and I'm I'm doing great. Don't worry about me, you know. Um, and and then it just got easier as I practiced it. But it's like anything else in the beginning it's, it's hard to walk away from that and to walk on stage the first time, not taking a shot or not taking a pill before I went on stage. I'm like, am I going to be as good of a storyteller? Am I going to feel this as deep? And I think the thing that got me over the hump was hearing people tell me, man, I don't know what's different, but this is the best show I've ever seen. Or this is the best show of yours I've ever seen, or you've never sounded better even my dad was telling me, he's like, hey, really? Boy, yeah. So much better. And I never made a big deal out of quitting. I just did it for me. I didn't want to parade it around because I didn't want to be unsuccessful at it and kind of have it thrown back at you, you know? Yeah. Um, and then you get to a point where I think you get comfortable with it, where you're like, man, I did and still do have bouts of depression that are really difficult for me and to get out of. And you got to fight through them, yeah. Um, but it's much easier now with a clear head and a clear mind and a clear direction. I think when I was, you know, eating pills or when I was drinking whiskey, um, I I never had that clear direction. It was just like that, you know, there's no port in a storm kind of a thing. It's like floating and, um, and you, I just had to find my way. Yeah. You're a fighter. Obviously, everybody who's listening can pick that up. Um, but what they may not know about you, Jeremy, is that you are a straight up a uh, jujitsu fighter. So uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the things that you learned on the mat while you were, you know, training and getting beat up a little bit. And you uh, know, still getting beat up. I'm terrible. Uh, By the way, you just got done with, uh, you know, sparring right before this right episode, before right? Here. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, that was another thing too. I think that I channeled a lot of the energy from the depression, from, you know, coming off of all that stuff into like, I just wanted to change who I was mentally, physically. I look like shit. Um, you know, I was overweight or I, I used to call it skinny fat. Like I could put on <laughs> skinny like fat medium t-shirt up top would be fine, but down below it have a little tire. So I'd hide it. And, um, but you can't hide that on the mat, right? No. That tire is going to show. Once you get on the mat, you start losing that and you start gaining other things and um, like like minded humans. And that was, you know, I started reading philosophy before I got into jujitsu and I, I really found what I needed in uh, Stoic philosophy. I uh-huh. love Stoicism, um, Marcus Aurelius and Zeno and Seneca the Younger. And um, I really just started going like, okay, if, if we're going to stop drinking, we're going to make a total transformation. And I, I want to go as deep into myself as, as I can and, and as deep into my mind and my childhood and find the scary stuff. Yeah. I was going to say, that'd be scary for a lot of people. Um, and it is, and there's still stuff that, you know, you don't really know how to deal with, but, um, you just forgive yourself. You're not who you were then. And, you know, I'm not who I was a week ago. And, um, so that's always my path now is like at the end of the night, forgiving yourself. And that was the first thing that stoicism really kind of taught me where Uh I was like, we're going to, we're going to wipe the slate clean at the end of the day. We're not going to hold ourselves, um, to the mistakes and the fuck ups of today. We're going to learn from them, find the opportunity to grow. We're going to wipe the slate and tomorrow we got another shot at it. God willing, you know, if we wake up and, um, the more I read about it, all of these Roman dudes were doing Roman Greco wrestling yeah, and grappling. Right. And that was part of the philosophy. So I always liked watching MMA. I'm not an athlete. I've, uh, I've always been terrible at sports. And so I went in, I found a gym here in Nashville called Legion Jiu Jitsu. Um, and there was this morning crew of guys and I, I went in and they started whipping my ass and, you know, doing the intro to yeah. jujitsu for me. And, and I started to feel a transformation, not only physically, 
mentally, spiritually, but the men that, that I were rolling with in, in, in the morning, these guys that I was meeting, I started to notice there was this common denominator. Yeah. They came from so many different walks of life, so many different backgrounds, but they were all successful, all of them, um, in whatever they did. I'm not wealthy, but you know, this guy's a police officer. This guy's an army ranger. This guy's a, a Navy guy. Uh, this guy's a cop. This guy works at a fast food joint. This kid's 18. But everybody had this successful mindset of next, you know, we're going to lift each other up. Yeah. And you would choke somebody until they tapped and they would congratulate you on it. You know, man, you got me. Good job, man. You know, you started to feel this growth. Yeah. And it's the only thing I've ever done in my entire life where you feel really good for your friends when they almost break uh -huh. your arm or yeah. they don't choke you unconscious, you know, where it's like, dude, great setup, whip my ass. And the more I did it, the more I did it, the more I did it. And um, I'm only in a couple of years at this point, uh, two, two and a half years. I'm a, a blue belt, um, but I'm able to train under some incredible yeah. professors yeah. from um, professor Chad Bradley, professor, uh, Sean Patton, Professor Gabriel. Um, it's a checkmat school here in, uh -huh. in Nashville. And it's, um, I just love the principles. I loved that these dudes were willing to get up at five in the morning and go in mm -hmm. and we're fighting at six and we're doing it until seven or seven 30. And by seven 30 AM, you know, you see all these you're, people. You're spent. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, man, the aggression's gone. Yeah. My mind is clear and um, I'm ready to, take on kind of the day, you know, nothing's going to be as bad as getting choked on conscious. <laughs> That's right. So. Yeah. Jeremy, you may not know this, but I spend a good bit of time doing some grappling myself. I had the privilege of learning grappling from some pretty amazing, uh, fighters in the army. And, yeah. uh, I learned a few things on the mat. I have a segment of my show that I like to do where I just get a little lighthearted with people but I also like to talk about, you know, some of those experiences. So I want you, I, I'm going to give you, this is what I call the high five. Like my high five or my top five mistakes that I made, the lessons that I learned from those mistakes while I was grappling with a dude on the mat. Um, and, yeah. and as I'm talking, I want you to think about a time or two where you realized, oh, that was a mistake. Yep. I learned a, lo a hard lesson that on that one. Um, yeah. But I'll go first. All right. I had a buddy who I served with, um, and he was a no kidding collegiate wrestler, like a big 10 championship wrestler. And one day, you know, we were sitting around, we we're bored, nothing to do. And he and I decided, why don't we just go outside into the front yard in front of the barracks and let's just wrestle. And like an hour and 45 minutes later, both of us are so physically exhausted that neither one of us can continue to, you know, put a move on another guy, but neither one of us want to quit and nobody is, is tapping out. And to this day, that may have been the most exhausted that I've ever been wrestling with this big 10 champion wrestler, just because I thought, well, I'm bored, got nothing else to do. Let me go fight the, the toughest fighter in the room. Right. Learned a hard lesson on that one. Yes. Um, yeah. Hey, I, I, I'll never forget when I first started grappling and, and the guys were teaching me how to get on the mat and how to, you know, start to do some moves. They had to tell me over and over again. It sounds insane to somebody listening to this, but they had to remind me to breathe because I was getting so focused that I forgot to breathe. And yeah. then all of a sudden I'm getting out of breath and, and hypoxic because I'm so focused on what I'm supposed to do next. And yeah. I can't tell you how many times somebody had to say, Jeff, you need to breathe. Got to breathe. Yeah. You got to breathe. Um, I had to learn along the way, um, that I'm the kind of guy who doesn't want to tap out. I'd rather you break my arm or choke me out than tap out. And I had to <laughs> learn a time or two, like, look, it's embarrassing and it does hurt your ego a little bit to tap out, but your arm in a cast because you were in an arm bar and somebody snapped, a, you know, a pretty important, uh, you know, uh, joint that's much worse an arm in a cast for yeah. six months. So just tap out. Just tap. Um, I got, uh, somebody put me, I couldn't even figure out what I was doing to get in the guard when somebody had already spun me around and put me, this is one of the most embarrassing moments, put me in, uh, in an arm bar and I'm already done. And, and I haven't been on the map for 12 seconds yet. 
yeah. and only in, in jujitsu ju -jitsu would something like that happen to you. But for me, maybe the biggest lesson and perhaps the biggest mistake that I made is not realizing that smarter beats stronger on the mat every time. Yeah. I always used to try to be the strongest guy, you know, who, who had the most force and who could put the lever, you know, use uh, muscle as a lever and then realize that the strongest muscle on the mat is the guy who's smart and the little scrawny guy who's smarter will win every single time. Yeah, it's true. Those I, are some of my lessons, man. What about you? Yeah, it's the same. Um, the breathe thing is such a big deal. And I've, I've translated that into like daily life too, where, you know, you get pissed off about something or, or something happens instead of immediately reacting, uh, which is what I would have done years ago. Now sitting back and going, I'm going to take, I need to take three breaths here. Yeah. And it's a lot like when somebody gets you inside control and they're smashing you or they get you in full mount and they're smashing you. To be able to find a place to just you can just breathe through breathe. it. Yeah. So it's like, okay, I'm in a really bad situation right now. I need to find somewhere to breathe. Let's get the breathing out of the way yeah. first. I need to catch my breath. Let's assess the situation. And then we're going to start, you know, systematically trying to get the fuck out of this right. position that I'm in right now. And that's what I love about jujitsu. I mean, I'm so bad at it. I, I'm a blue belt, um, and it's consistently humbling um, to just be, you know, you feel like, and you have these days where you're like, man, I had a really great day today. And then you'll get, the next day, you'll get beat by four yeah. white belts. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's just, and that's the thing that I really loved about grappling is removing this ego. And, oh, yeah. And, and stripping that away because again, that's always been the thing that got me in the most trouble was like being able to take a step back and go, why, why am I feeling this way? Oh, I'm feeling this way because um, you know, I'm butthurt about my ego right. on this or somebody said something that, you know, it didn't stroke my ego and jujitsu has really helped me be able to step back and find a place to breathe yeah. because in jujitsu, as you said, um, if you aren't breathing, even when you're on top and, you know, especially you when you're excited start, about you know, being in a good position, you yeah. know, you're just uh, grabbing on for dear life and trying to hold on. You gas yourself out. Yeah. And, and it's the same in life. And, and I, I've found that to be so helpful to be able to just take a step back and breathe. And, and I've really gotten close with uh, our morning crew guys um, who I can bounce in. I can talk to anything about, I can bounce stuff off that I'm dealing with, you know, and um, I think the biggest thing that I learned very quickly is just uh, tap fast yeah, yeah. and, um, and that it's not the end. I think that's another great that's thing right. too. Like you can reevaluate, re-engage, learn from the tap and then go back in and go, okay, well maybe if I can see that coming next time, it was worth it. Yeah. You're you know? learning to survive the fight again. Right. Yes. Yep. This is going to be a crazy segue, but you're, uh, if you're listening to this and you've never been uh, on the mat doing some jujitsu or grappling, you're thinking to yourself, you can't be serious and forget to breathe, but you can, you can just get so focused and yeah. so uh, twisted around that you literally just forgot to breathe. Um, mm -hmm. It's happened to me. I think it's happened to most guys when they're guys and gals, when they're first getting, getting started in some kind of MMA. Um, I want to transition now to let's talk about your music. Let's talk about what, the, how, how your music career is going right now. And here's my segue. Are you ready for this? Uh, let's talk about easy as breathing the song that you, uh, that, you know, that you pinned, um, because you learned on the mat, Hey, I got to breathe, uh, or else. Uh, I, 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 sometimes I just got to find the space to breathe. So let's talk about some of the music career and how the, how the song easy as breathing got you, you know, really started to move things along the charts for you. Yeah, we had, um, you know, we had a couple of singles out on Warner brothers back then. We put out wagon wheel, uh, mm -hmm. in like 2006 country radio was like, this song's never going to get played. Uh, on the radio and then, you know, seven years. Well, that's later, encouraging. Yeah. Everybody hates this song. Don't, don't, don't release it. 
Yeah, it was like, hey, this is two country, never going to get played on the radio. Seven years later, Darius hits number one with it. And um, so I felt good about that. I'm like, hey, at least we were right. Um, had a tune called This Town Needs a Bar, which, which moved the needle a ton for us. And then, you know, I lost my record deal. I got divorced, lost the house, you know, fell into kind of that woe is me stuff before I met my wife. Um, and, Courtney, yeah. Yeah, Courtney. And and kind of started working through all those things. And it was because of her, it was like, you know, you just need to keep recording and keep showing up. And, um, you know, you might be getting struck out standing in the batter's box, taking a thousand pitches, but eventually you're going to you hit, hit the big one. You're going to hit something. Even if it's just a, a ground ball, the first base, let's just make some contact. And, that's kind of what easy as breathing was. Um, I wrote that with Kevin Kadish who had written a bunch of stuff with um, Jason Mraz and people that I really dug. Yeah. And I'll never forget as I was leaving that day, there was a girl he told me about that he found at Belmont and she was coming over to write some stuff. Um, and, and we were, he was very excited about easy as breathing. I felt like, and as I left, I said hi to the girl and it turned out to be Megan Trainer, and they wrote what? Her, like, Come her on. whole first album, like all about uh, the bass. Uh, you, you, and he never not... thought about Easy as Breathing. No again. <laughs> way. <laughs> but Easy as Breathing was it was great for me. It, it was a little summertime song that, that some radio stations around the country played, and it, it built these markets even stronger for me to be able to do the album. Um, that was Leap in the Net Will Appear. And then um, I kind of hold myself up with a couple of friends and, yeah. and wrote uh, FM. And FM was kind of my George Carlin. I was reading Carlin's book about, you know, him being censored and uh -huh. comedy. And he was thrown out of Las Vegas for using the word bullshit on stage. And, and um, he wanted to show the switch. And so he went AM, FM, and that was his... So when I did FM, um, I always heard my stuff was not commercial enough. You know, your, oh, your songs don't sound like they should be on the radio. So I did a radio record uh, while keeping the integrity, yeah. which was my, yeah, I wanted to keep good songs. And, you know, I didn't want every song to be about a tailgate and a truck. And um, so while trying to keep the integrity of it, we called the record FM. Uh, for the radio stations and um, we I'm still really proud of that record it, we talked to like five or six different labels and it was going to get signed and it wasn't going to get signed and we had a couple stations playing it and then it fell off and um, and so I worked through that and it's just kind of been this you know you have all these hopes for a record and then it doesn't